Okay, this is the sixth of the Jude uh, on Peter series, sub-series. Again, we're trying to work, I'm trying to work out the dating of Jude. First thing I need to do is show you the meter. This is 54 syllables in the Greek. It's divisible by three. The Bible has primarily, primarily two time meters it uses. Seven factoring and three factoring. I have never seen a three factor meter used for a date line. The first two or three verses of a Bible book should always be a date line. I have to test that hypothesis further, but testing it here, this is divisible by three, not two, uh, not seven. Okay? And then this, okay, is part of it, verse two. And then verse 3, this is 60 syllables. I'm sorry, um, let me go back. Verse 1 and 2, let me go back here. Let me restate that, I screwed it up. This is 54 syllables. I expected that to be a date line because it's a whole syntactical phrase. That's the way the metering works. It's 54 syllables. It's divisible by 3, not 7. And I'm like, what? And then frequently, there is a second date line in Bible books. So I thought, okay, let's look at verse 3. Because that also syntactically stands on its own. This is 60 syllables. Okay, that's divisible by 3. Neither one are divisible by 7. And I'm like, how come? Now... If it's divisible by three, that kind of accounts for the fact that he's not using timeless language. The, the parts of the Bible where you've got divisible by seven factors that are date lines, the text is usually this timeless thing, okay? But as you can see, this is just prosaic text. But apparently you can use prosaic text with a divisible by three date line, because look, am I recording? Okay, 54 years after, 54 syllables equals 54 years after X. We'll not define X just yet. This one is 60 syllables equals years after. After what? Well, if I'm going to go by the same kinds of measuring devices that the other Bible writers use, um, in... Revelation 1 through 3, Revelation 1 through 2 is divisible by 7, but John is writing a timeless, you know, uh, book. So what he's saying is that 84 years after Judea became a province, if I apply that same standard that's in John's Revelation to Jude, which is earlier than John, I could say 60 years after Judea became a province, which would be 66 AD, which would end up being our 68 AD, because the Bible uh, has a, like a two-year earlier accounting than we do. Now, I have yet to prove the provenance of that yet, but um, Paul is using a two-year earlier date. He's saying he wrote Ephesians in 56 AD, we say it's 58. So what's the accounting for the extra two years? And we got that problem with Roman dating. So let's just say 68 for 66 here, okay? So is this 60, 66, which will equal our 68 AD due to the difference in Roman dating style? Because they're using Roman dating. They didn't use our BC AD system. They're using a different BC AD system, okay? That's based on Roman Roman. Um, years. Okay, so is this our 68 AD? That would make sense. It's going to present some problems as a result, but okay. So then what would this be if this is 54 years has to be after, it has to equate to 68 AD. It has to be 54 years after X. What's X? All right. Now, bearing in mind that using the Roman system, they would call 66 AD what we call 68 AD. So then Jude is saying 54 years before 66 AD was, and the answer is, 12 AD. 
end of 12 AD to be specific. What was the end of 12 AD? Christ's 12th birthday. See, because they're measuring, they're really using their own Anno Domini based on Christ's birth. Paul established that in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. So did Mary and her Magnificat. So, and it's right, you're dating years of a king, right? 54 years after he became, under Jewish law, a man. I'm not sure why that's important. That's also the same year that Tiberius first entered into co-regency with his father, Augustus. He was adopted that year. Or actually, he was adopted before. But the, the actual thing didn't come to fruition until he became co-regent in 12 AD when Augustus was starting to get really sick. Okay? Augustus died in 14 AD. So, when Jesus, 54 years after Jesus Christ became a man and the co-regency of Tiberius, all right, because I always use triple dating in scripture, and 60 years after Judea became a province, I, Jude, am writing you using the meter. Now, I'm saying this as a hypothesis. What I have to do is check the other Bible books to see if they use the troubled meter for their own date lines, because it's the first time I'm, I'm seeing it. Okay? Everybody else I've seen uses the seven factor for their date lines. So this is going to be kind of important tool in hermeneutics to date Bible books. All right. Sorry I spent so much time on that. Okay, hold on a minute. Sorry, telephone. Um, if that's true, then we got some problems. All right? He was getting ready to write them about the salvation we share, but now he has to write to urge to contend for the faith. Okay? And now he's explaining why. Certain men have slipped among you. Now again, what he's saying is Peter's prophecy came true. Has already come true. Okay, but if he's writing in the same year as Peter, but after Peter died, which would be the justification for him writing at all, because he would be the next guy on the totem pole that was left to speak for, like, you know, the group, then... This is happening, like, right away. Okay? And, and the, problem, the problem with that is that he wasn't going to write about it. He was going to write about something else. So he didn't know that this is true now. He was caused to know that this is true now. So what he writes about now is instead about the importance of understanding this problem. Which means that Peter had been out for a while, okay? Because he's saying, though you already know all this, okay? In other words, they knew all from Peter that this was going to happen, but they didn't know it was happening now. Otherwise, there's no reason for him to write. See, he's letting them know. They've secretly slipped in. In other words, he didn't know. He suddenly has to change what he's going to write about to write about these guys instead, which obviously the people he's writing to don't know about, or he wouldn't be writing to them. So apparently, the only conclusion I can draw that fits it together with sense is that Peter forecasted, and it came true within months of his letter being distributed because they already knew what Peter's letter said. Now maybe this you already know all this, all right, is not really what it said. See, that's where we got our problem with hot pox. Let me show you. I got to pull up the, the, I'm having trouble with my mouse. Something in the Windows updates to XP have made XP much harder to use. I'm just not going to do any more Windows updates anymore. Um, these are the different Bible manuscripts on this verse. 
The verse in question, the word in question is this word here, hapax. Where does it belong in the sentence? In the Bible Works own version, you know, because they do their own compilation, it belongs in front of Lao, which means people. So it, it literally says, the Lord, once and for all, the people out from Egypt. Oh, crud. The Lord, once and for all, out from Egypt, save them. Okay? That's what they think the right text is. Okay, but in the NIV, they're using a different text. They're using a text, I'm not sure which of these, but they're using this. And this is Stephanos. They might not be using Stephanos. But notice how Stephanos is putting hapax just after idotas, which is where the NIV is getting already. The Stephanos text is 1550. This is Tischendorf. It also puts... Um, Hapax there. Tischendorf is, an, is the Codex, I forget if it's Sinaiticus or Vaticanus. Sinaiticus. Um, I think it's Sinaiticus. Um, Hapax is just after Idotas. So it's an older text. And Stephanus preserves that same order, which is 1550. All right. Westcott and Hort also have the same order. And they're basically using Vaticanus, I think. It's also called the UBS text, all right? The Byzantine, however, sometimes, see, like here, it's hapax in front of, you know, after idotas, all right? But it's not uniform, okay? So the question is, does hapax belong here in front of people? The Lord once delivered the people out of Egypt, which makes more sense. Or does it go in front of, you know, you once knew, or you knew already, okay? And that's where the majority of the witnesses are. Well, no, they aren't, because that's, well, that's the GNT, that's also UBS. Um, this is Scrivener, this is what the King James Bible is based on, okay? You once already knew all this, okay? You once already knew Stephanas. Tischendorf, which is Sinaiticus, I think it's Sinaiticus. You already knew this, all this. Okay? Westcott and Hort, you already knew all this. Okay? Frankly, it makes more sense to put Hapax here. All right? But whichever way you translate it, he is saying, okay? Oh, I've got the wrong translation here. Let's do the NIV. Go to NIV. All right. Oh, sorry. NIV, hello. Okay. Even though he's saying, though you already knew all this, even if that's in the wrong place, the meaning is still the same. It's just a question of already. See, if you take that out of the sentence, even though you know all that, you know this. You don't need hapax to be located there to get the same meaning out of the sentence. Okay? But it does matter for the rest of what he's saying. The Lord once and for all delivered his people out of Egypt. Okay? So, what we're faced with here is if we're looking at a 68 AD date, then our boy... Jude is being interrupted by God to write on a topic he wasn't planning on writing on because this was suddenly made known to him as true. And so now he has to make known to the others that it's true. And if he's getting it from God, that would account for why this letter is con considered canonical. Okay? And so when, he's, when it says, although you know this, just cut the word already, all right? Though you know this, I want to remind you. Well, remind you of what? that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, they would have known that already from the Old Testament. So the word already doesn't really harm the meaning here or change it. But here's what changes. Here's what I'm trying to determine. For him to bring that up first, why does he bring that up first? Because Peter doesn't. Which implies that Peter's letter is written before the book of Hebrews but that Jude is written after 
Now, I, you know, this is this is slim evidence, okay? But it 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 makes sense because why would Jude put in his letter what was not in Peter's letter? Peter didn't reference this. He referenced the flood. He referenced Sodom and Gomorrah. He referenced the angels. He didn't reference this. But the book of Hebrews chapter 3 does. So if Hebrews is based on 2 Peter, I mean, you know, elaborating on it, because the, very clearly the book of Hebrews elaborates on Ephesians, Colossians, um, and the book of uh, and Galatians and the book of Hebrews. I mean, the uh, book of uh, Peter very clearly does that. I can trace that. But the references specifically to specific words that Peter used are very few in the book of Hebrews. I can only find near and I can find milk. Well, near is the cornerstone of the letter in Mark. His whole gospel is around the word near. So we could argue that Mark's gospel is also plain to Second Peter about false teachers because the whole theme of it is based on that. And the same thing is true in the book of Hebrews. So does that mean Jude also was written after the book of Hebrews? Because remember, we're talking about a 12-month window here. So I'm sort of, you know, contradicting what I said in earlier videos that I didn't believe that, it, that this would be a reminder written so quickly because our boy is interrupted in what he wanted to write with this topic. God interrupted him. That's the argument I'm making. I mean, you know, it seems like that's the argument you can make. Why is it so soon after Peter? Well, because, you know what? The false teachers are here. And that it would explain that the book of Hebrews, yes, had come out because that's on the same topic. Okay, it's based on people not believing after they have proof. Okay, well, here's the proof. What Peter said is already true. And here's what happened per the book of Hebrews chapter 3. And see, since they do know this, even if we cut out the word already, since they do know all this, it means that they already had the book of Hebrews. They already had maybe Mark's gospel. That's still up in the air in my mind, because I don't see Jude referring to Mark's gospel specifically. Um, so maybe it was Peter, then the book of Hebrews, then Jude, then Mark's gospel to sort of cap it off. Okay? All coming out within a 12-month window. Because why is he bringing this up if it isn't to refer them back to? Hebrews, which they would have already had to have by the time he writes. And lest anybody think, well, 12 months is too short a time to disseminate it. No, it's not. It's 20 days to Thessalonica from, from Rome. Okay, another 20 days maybe, and that's going by boat. Maybe 20 days, 25 days to get to Jerusalem. I did, I, you know, I have in one of my um, Word documents a chart of traveling times that somebody did in ancient in ancient time, first century, Rome, how long it took to get from one place to another. Because I needed to use that to talk about Diocletian. Okay, so here you go. Well, first to third century. Okay, so he must be bringing up Hebrews 3 here. And he's doing it succinctly because after all, Hebrews 3 is a long chapter on the topic. So he doesn't have to say much. Okay, and then angels, that was the topic in Hebrews 1 and 2. All right, now he's, of course, talking to 2 Peter 2. And these are all 2 Peter, these are Petrine references. But the writer of Hebrews brings up the same thing in Hebrews 1 and 2. Okay, and then the whole idea of contending. Faith that once for all was entrusted to the saints, that's, you know, echoed in Hebrews 1 either echoed in Hebrews 1 or it's saying it, and that's why he's saying what he's saying to echo Hebrews 1. See how close these are? Okay, and angels is the first topic in Hebrews 1 and 2. And it's also the topic in Peter. So maybe the writer of Hebrews is playing to Peter by talking about the angels and how we got the Bible now. 
And it's only going to come through people writing down scripture, not through dreams and visions anymore. Okay? So that's pretty much all I wanted to say in this episode. I mean, I could probably do more, but right now my brain is out, so I'm signing off.